Hi, my name is Keith Cooper and in this video I'm going to have a look at the general workflow going from scanning a bit of black and white film through to a final print. Now this is uh, the Epson V850 scanner which I'm currently testing. I've got some information on that. If you want more information about that I'll put some links in the notes for the video. But I'm going to take some film that uh, I actually shot back in 1994. That's not quite the last time I used film, but um, I've not used any recently. Now, things with old film. Um, I hope you've kept it well and you've kept it clean because, as I'll show in a bit, uh, cleaning up dust on scans, even with automated systems, uh, which don't necessarily work well on black and white negatives, um, can be a trouble. So it's a lot of work. But um, if it's a picture you want to do, then so on. Now, I mentioned when I did the overview and the review of the actual scanner itself, and this is the V850, that there is nothing better to make you curate your collection of old negatives and decide which are actually worth scanning than trying to do it. If you have this vision of going through thousands and thousands of negatives, scanning them, putting them into an archive, well, you better have plenty of spare time and some good books to read whilst it's scanning, because it takes several minutes per image to scan. Now, it varies depending on what software you use. Now, my normal scanning software would be ViewScan, which I've used for years, works with loads of different scanners. But I'm going to use the Epson Scan software because for scanning very smallish numbers of pictures like this, it's actually perfectly fine. Um, I found an old box of slides the other day, uh, loaded up a load of slides into the slide holder, um, scanned them. There we go, found out what they are, whether they were worth going. They're, they're old family pictures, so um, they're not stuff I'm going to use here for showing this. But uh, the image I'm going to start off with is one I shot in Canada, as I say, in 1994. Um, I wasn't entirely certain. Let's just... I wasn't entirely certain what was in the envelope of pictures. Now, I used to have a darkroom, so I have some experience of actually looking at negatives and working out what pictures they are. Now, I remember the pictures, but the easy way to do it was just to take the envelope of negatives, put it in the scanner in transparency mode, do a fairly low resolution scan, takes a minute or so to do that, at enough to be able to see detail in the pictures and decide which ones are worth scanning further. Um, the fact that they're in the envelope doesn't really make much difference. It softens it a bit. It means there's a bit low contrast here, but you could tweak it if you wanted to. So that is actually a scan of an entire envelope of pictures. Now, that's much quicker than taking the pictures out of the envelope, risking getting dust on them, and putting them into one of the holders here. Now, the holder here, as it is at the moment, has a uh, colour negative in it. Um, something else. I'm going to I'm going to have a look at color negatives in a, in another video. But this was this is a specific one for black and white. Although it's general scanning as well. So I have the negative in here. Um, it takes you a few minutes to load things up here. There's a limited number you can get. Depends how what size your negatives were cut to. Which is why if you get the V850, you get a second uh, holder of each type, so that. Whilst you're scanning, you can be loading up the next set into it. So that is it. It has a film on it, anti-Newton film, so you won't get Newton fringes on it. I've not had a problem. Um, I did have a bit of a play with the height adjustments on here and think that having them set at the midpoint gives perhaps a marginally sharper image. I don't know um, because these are old films. They were shot on old lenses. In fact, the picture I'm going to show here today, working through to the print, was actually shot using the exact same lens I'm using for filming this video back in 1994. An Olympus 24mm. Uh, at the time I had it on an OM2 um, and I still use it. It's now via an adapter on an EOS RP, Canon RP, and that's what I use for all these videos. So, um, you know, just because it's an old lens, uh, it, it's also not the sharpest of lenses. It's good. But it's not brilliant. I mean, it's fine for video and it's fine. I've used it elsewhere. But for this picture, 
It's not a matter of going back. And in fact, I'll when I show you the picture, you'll realize why I cannot go back and retake that picture. But anyway, there's the scanner. There's how I've set it up and um, I've done. This is a preview scan. Uh, this is with the film in the holder. I've in the settings here, the scan settings, I've gone for 48 bit color, the maximum resolution for it. I'm scanning in color because I'm going to turn it into black and white at some point of that. I'm not going to use, it doesn't give me anything extra, but as I'll show in a bit, some bits of software that I might want to use in Photoshop really don't like handling grayscale images. So if you have them as an RGB image, so R equals G equals B, so a black and white image, but in an RGB space, bigger file, but doesn't really matter. Um, I'm going to scan this at 6,400 DPI. Now that's supposedly the maximum of this. It's, yeah, once you get into measuring DPI and things on film, actual resolution stuff and lenses, it is a vast subject of discussion. Well, actually, it used to be a vast subject of discussion. It is far less of a discussion subject these days because not that many people, relative to, relatively speaking to what it used to be, use film anymore. So you, if you're getting into film, you want to really sort of practice your scanning because there's no point going for all the faffing about with film. With film and then sort of making a mess of the sort of scanning. Now, you might want to go the whole hog. I used to have a darkroom here, Hasn't, haven't had it for many a year now, and I used to do prints as well. So most of these images I have seen printed, chemically printed, and so I know which what they look like, but I've scanned them before as well. So this is the basic scan. I'm not doing anything special here. Um, I'm letting it do its auto exposure. I'm going to, I'm working at 16 bit when I'm in grayscale, so I'm going to be able to chop out the, where the set the contrast levels and everything for that, so it won't be a problem for working for it. Now, once I've done that, there's the TIFF image that I've got from the scanner. It looks a bit dark. However, that's because the scanner is just, that's the full range that the scanner is capable of. Now that's a good sign because uh, the negative is not perfectly exposed and uh, the, the scene itself uh, was fairly flat lighting with a few deep shadows on it. But that's the image, the TIFF image, save it as a TIFF file, 16 bit uh, color. Uh, I've flattened it in Photoshop and it's now in a 16-bit grayscale. Just one thing about grayscale color spaces, I work in Grey Gamma 2.2, it's one of the Photoshop standards, I've used it for years. If you're going to be converting to color and to, um, to black and white, it's worth using a Gamma 2.2 space for your color images, that's the source images here. Uh, Adobe 98 is a Gamma 2.2 scale. sRGB is close to 2.2, but has a few minor differences. And I just keep it simple by having a color, color uh, working space that's 2.2 and a black and white space, gray Gamma 2.2, which is also a Gamma 2.2 space. So there's the image. Um, yeah, it looks a bit dark. Uh, this has been converted to a positive. So first thing I really want to do is uh, adjust the levels. Now, simple Photoshop operation here. Um, I'm gonna mention using this in Photoshop. You could do this perfectly well in Affinity Photo. Now, I can't give step-by-step -step guides for these things. One thing, to make them precise enough for people to follow step-by-step, -step, I need to make it very specific. That's specific to the fact that I happen to do it on an oldish Mac or I happen to do it on some... I mean, I've not used a PC for many, many years. So if I make it too specific, I'm ruling out a lot of people. So I've had a long-standing you know, principle of never go doing step-by-step -step guides. If you want that sort of recipe approach, I'm afraid you'll have to look, where, look elsewhere. I try and cover the principles of what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, and then if you're using a different bit of software, well, it's up to you to decide whether you want to follow those same principles and find your own way of doing it. Now, most things, it won't be much difference, but just remember there will be differences, particularly when it comes to sharpening and things like that. So there's the image. Um, what is it? It is the toe of the Athabasca Glacier in Canada, in the Rockies, as it was in autumn 1994. Now, 
That's why I say you won't be able to go back and take that picture because I'm pretty sure that if I went back to this same spot and I haven't, I'd love to go back and see what it looks like now. I'm sure that the glacier has retreated some considerable distance up the valley. I believe it's still there for the time being. Um, and you know, probably it would look quite similar when you got up to where the toe of it is now. But this is gone. Um, all the glaciers, every glacier I've ever visited, if I went back to, would be considerably less than it used to be. I've, I've not been to the poles, so I've not seen really big ice sheets and glaciers. But yeah, this is still pretty impressive. I do have a colour slide of it somewhere, which shows the lovely blue colour of the old ice that's showing it through that. That slide, however, not particularly good. I may have a go at scanning it. I'll see if I can find it and see what it looks like and see whether it's worth making a picture out of. But this was shot on film. And if I remember rightly, it was um, FP4 Ilford. Now I'd have to have a look at them, but it's a, a standard black and white film. I didn't develop this one. It was developed at a lab. Uh, it's a fairly clean one, but there's a lot of mess on it. Now, what am I going to do with sort of something like this? I've adjusted the levels and that means setting the white point and the black point. Now, if I was using view scan, I could have done that in the scanning process. There are options to do that. There are options in the Epson software, but this is just the basic scan. I'm not gaining any more by doing that bit of chopping while I'm doing the scanning. It doesn't make that much difference. Um, not because I'm, I'm working a 16 bit here. So let's have a look. Slight alteration of the gamma. Now, that's the midpoint of, so for a curve, I've either changed, so I've gone from a straight curve to a slightly curved curve, you know, straight line to a slight curve in a curve adjustment. Uh, likewise, in a levels adjustment, I've moved the center point of the um, of adjustment. So I've set the end points black and white, and I've moved it slightly. So if I just go back, you can see that's as it was, and that I've just lightened it up because that's what I want to do for print. OK, I've got my image. You might think, well, there we go. What's the difference now between doing this and printing an image from one of my images from uh, the shot on digitally? Uh, quite a lot when you look at the details of what's in the images. Because, for example, this one here, you can just about see grain on it. Now, always be a little wary when you see grain on scans uh, and you can adjust various settings of the scanning. You can do a little bit of sharpening when you scan. Um, I've gone for the basic process here of not tweaking it too much. If you've got a really good sharp negative, it is worth exper experimenting with some of the settings for scanning in terms of sharpening and resolution. But that's something you're just going to have to experiment with because it's different for almost every film. It's different for every image. Um, I found it, it's, there, there is no one size fits all. It really is a matter of you have to sort of tweak it. What looks better? You get a bit of a feel after a while of doing this because you know, I, I haven't done much film scanning and developing for 20 odd years. Um, where I, I, I've got quite a lot of prints which I've done from scanned film. And software has changed a little bit, but the basics of how you set your scanner sharpening, how you process things. These are not creative sharpening. This is just getting the best capture from it. Have a look at the actual written review for this, this scanner that uh, I've produced. That's got lots more details of things and, and looks in a lot more detail at different aspects of getting the optimal image quality. You may decide that um, you don't get a good enough quality out of something like this for what you want. And certainly if you're going larger format films, perhaps you might want to get your films drum scanned or something like that. Just be wary that it takes a while to be done and it's expensive. But if you've got an image that's worth it, maybe it's worth it. This is for doing lots of uh, slides, negatives large transparencies as well. It handles the lot of them and it does very well. Um, now, there's the image there. I've got a slight adjustment. What about sharpening? Now, my normal, uh, I've got several ways of going about sharpening. I discussed them in a recent video, uh, which looks, looks at aspects of sharpening. But there is the traditional unsharp masking, which 
which you might apply a little to in during the scanning process. It sometimes gives a better result. But as I said, if you see grain, always be wary that that may not be actual grain. It may be a product of aliasing from the scanning. So it may be an artifact. Um, actually getting detail of the grain can take a really high quality scanner. It depends on the film. Um, I can't remember what one, exactly what this was, what the film speed of this was, whether it was 100 or 400. Um, it was one of the two. But this is an old film that's been around for years. It was shot years ago. So you know, it's going to be, you, know, you get what you get and you have to work with what you've got to get from it. So I've done this here. What about the basic sharpening? Well, I can put it through something like Sharpen AI. Now, Sharpen AI I've looked at elsewhere is great with digital images. Sharpen AI has, if you set it on without much care, if you set it on a, a, a normal a scanned film, it will have an absolute fit because it will interpret the grain either as detail that's partially lost, detail that needs to be sharpened, you can get some really awful looks. Um, it's not optimized for film, um, but it can be used. In the example I've got here, what I've done is I've used in Sharpen AI, I've used an out of focus, very blurry setting, uh, because actually when you look at the scan and they get it, it shows up some of the problems of the lens. It's not the greatest of lenses if you want really high res. Um, that said, put that lens on um, my uh, 5DS, 50 megapixel, and I've got perfectly good shots out of it. I need to correct, do some corrections and things for, you know, chromatic aberration and stuff like that. But, you know, it's a fair bit I can do with it. So, you know, just because it's an old lens doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad lens. But in this instance, it's a little bit soft. If I try and add too much sharpness here, I don't sharpen subject detail. I end up sharpening structure of the film and I really don't want that. So I've set this, I've turned off suppressed noise because from this point, as far as this is concerned, grain is noise um, and it has strange effects if you crank that up too much. If you really want a sort of painterly look to your negatives, then great. But I've set this at level six. Now this is almost turned to nothing compared to what I'd use for digital image, but it makes just a nice improvement between the two. Um, and it just brings out a little bit of detail. It brings out the grain a little bit more, but not too much. Um, the temptation is to overdo the sharpening at this stage and don't because it won't look nice. One trick I would say is that when you do the sharpening, do the sharpening on a copied layer. So I've got my original image as a layer in Photoshop, duplicate that layer, then run the sharpening here on that duplicated layer and then blend the two together. And you've got a fine control by the blending to decide how much you want various aspects of the sharpening to show through and to blend with your base image. Takes a little bit of experimenting. Once again, depends on each shot. It will be different for different film, different for different lenses. There you go. So yeah, you've got to do a lot of experimenting with this sort of stuff. So there we go. I've sharpened the image a bit with, and it is just a bit, but enough to show using Sharpen AI. Now, is there anything else I can use? Well, it turns out that I can use a similar process on the sharpened image. I can now use Focus Magic, which is another tool I've used. In fact, I've used it since um, I believe I started using it when I'd first had some film to try. Yeah, yeah, when I first moved to digital and still had some film shots as well. So it does go back a long way. The version I've got here even lets me have a setting for film based sources. Now, if you try just a little bit of sharpening, it brings out the grain, an absolute treat. But if you increase the sharpening radius, now this is a deconvolution filter, so it's a little bit more subtle than the standard ones you get in uh, Photoshop and the likes. But if I take this up, the sharpening radius effectively, up to 10 pixels, which is quite a bit, what I see is it brings out de image detail rather than grain detail. Once again, um, it's something you need to experiment with. Do it on a layer, then you can blend as need be. 
So you can always try all of these different effects. You put them on different layers and then you can blend them together and see if something works better. Now, I've tried uh, for doing this. I, I then thought, well, I'm going to print it. I'm going to print this at a reasonable size. What about Sharpener Pro? Well, um, I've used it. It works well uh, on digital images. Where I tried it on uh, film images, it doesn't do so well. Like a lot of these things, it's a digital tool designed for digital images. Now you can use it. Um, I found out that you just needed to turn the sharpening right down and just use a bit of structure. And at this point I thought, well, if I want to do adjustments like this, um, I've got enough sharpness in the, in the actual image itself. Why not actually do the adjustments using silver effects? Now, Nick Silver Effects, I've used it for converting colour to black and white images quite a lot. But um, I've opened it here, I can make sure it was an RGB file, and I've got Silver Effects here opened um, with the image opened in it. And I can then sort of look at all the adjustments and things that I can do with that. But all I've actually done is give a tiny little bit of structure adjustment. I've turned the sharpening off completely because the sharpening just sharpens noise, film grain, doesn't sharpen the kind of detail I want. However, adding just a little bit of structure adjustment just brings up the local contrast in the image. Don't do it too much, otherwise you'll get sharpening halos and the like, and that you really don't want on film images. Um, so it just brings up the local contrast to allow for better printing. So I've adjusted that. Uh, there are several other adjustments. You can use, um, you can use the uh, settings here in Nick uh, Silver Effects. Silver Effects is one of those bits of software, as is Sharpen AI, that doesn't like being fed native grayscale images. So uh, even if I wasn't working in colour, I would need to convert my grayscale image to an RGB image, so R equals G equals B, so yeah, still a grayscale image but an RGB. I would need an RGB format image for this software to be able to work with it. Um, I've found this quite a few packages. Um, the developers obviously forgot that there is such a thing as grayscale images or that or they thought that, well, they just couldn't be bothered to handle them. But it makes no difference to the image, it just makes the file bigger. Uh, this, by the way, the scanned file, the TIFF file was 480 megabytes. So you're not going to be doing a lot of these before you start eating up your disk space. But there we go. I've just added a little bit of structure, local contrast enhancement, corrects for a bit of the softness, and that also will correct for a bit of the printing. I'm not going to do any actual print sharpening as such, because print sharpening, um, as it's normally applied, if you do that on things with film grain in it, um, it sees the grain as fine detail. Um, great if you want to make, you know, in grainy looking images and I noticed there is in this you could add fake grain in if you really wanted to but there is real grain here so we're not going to bother with that one. So there we go I've got that image um, I've processed it that um, I can change other things these are a couple of other nick adjustments um, this is a soft focus or soft contrast uh, at the two extremes um, I don't like, I, I particularly don't like this one, but uh, this one doesn't quite feel right to it. But you can make minor adjustments at this point. Well, yeah, make major adjustments if that's what you like. Um, but I'm trying to make something that looks like a well-produced darkroom print. I'm not looking for something that looks like I got a digital shot and ran it through lots of filters. Um, I don't want it to look digital. Um, now, the interesting question is what that actually means, and almost everyone who ever uses the term means something different about it. But I, yeah, I want it to think, yeah, that could be a film print. It's a half decent one. Now I'm going to make a big print. This is only a 35 mil neg. What am I going to do for printing? Well, I'm going to print straight from Photoshop. I could print from. Uh, since I'm printing this on the Epson P5000, I could use the Epson print software for this. I'm using the black and white, the ABW mode. If I printed it on, say, a Canon Pro 300, then I'd use the Canon black and white print mode. What about paper choices for it? Well, for this one, I'm going to take a paper which is like a, fairly like a bright 
photo paper. I'm going to use uh, Inova IFA 49. It's so one I'm testing. I've got a roll of it here. It's one I've used for quite a few years on things. And basically I'm going to just print it. Um, I've resized it to fit a suitable piece of paper. Can't even remember what the resolution of it is at this, but it's it's probably about four or five hundred uh, pixels per inch. So it's enough that it's going to get all the detail the printer can provide. I'm at printer settings. I'm using the printer for the P5000 I'm using on its maximum print quality, that's 2880. If I had a P700, P900 and was printing it on this, I would not use the higher, if I printed black and white, I would not use the highest print quality settings. I'd go similarly for the 2880. Now I've looked at detail for printers and things like that, but those were digital images, not with this. So I always remember the two print subtly differently. So. There we go, there's that. What about the print? Well, here's the one I made earlier. Here is the print. Now I'll just move this round so hopefully it won't get too much in the way of reflections on the, on the video. Uh, there we go, I just thought of that. Now, what does it look like? Well, um, it looks like a print I could have produced in the darkroom on a bright RC style paper. Although this actually is a uh, fiber based paper. So this one is, in terms of general papers, this is quite similar to the Epson Exhibition Fiber traditional photo paper. It's that style of paper. It's not a brilliant white paper. Um, I did think of printing it uh, maybe on a matte paper. This, if at this size, and remember this is a 35mm negative breaking up to this size, so there, there is grain I can see in the sky. Um, I've kept it sort of under control, but you can still see all of this. Um, it, it obviously looks like a film image. So how I want to show this, this is where the choices come in. Now I've printed it straight off using the ABW mode because that prints um, bang on neutral. Uh, I've not put any adjustments in it. Uh, the shadow here is fine. It's it's nice and black. Um, there's plenty of detail in it. Uh, the structure in the ice is all there. Um, yeah, it's a really nice print of that negative. It reminds me of that day in 1994 when I walked up to the toe of the glacier and actually sort of it's the first first time I'd ever stood on a glacier. Um, I used to be a geologist um, and one of my specialist areas was um, recent geology, so glacial stuff, um, probably because I come from Suffolk, um, where, where the whole county has effectively been covered with stuff that's dropped out of glaciers and in various stages and things. But yeah, looking at the detail, there's the mud and gravel underneath it. Um, there's the residual bits of rock and dust in the ice where it's melting away. Um, I said the only bit missing from it would be that that eerie blue colour that you get from the ice. Uh, but there we go. There is a print from the 35mm slide. Now, what else might I do with this? Other ways I might process? As I said, I might try a different paper. This I might decide that I want more of an arty look to it at this size and I might go for um, a matte paper, a cotton rag paper. Don't think I'd go for a textured paper. I'd want a smooth paper. Um, the, the image itself, um, there's a softness about it, uh, but that's, as I said, if, yeah, the camera, the film, whatever I did when I was taking this particular picture. But is it a picture that works? Could I have got better? Well, if I spent a bit longer tweaking the settings on the scanner, maybe a little bit. If I'd looked at more ways of sharpening and changed the contrast levels, I might have changed a little bit. Would it change the essential essence of the picture? No. Um, I think I've got this one. Works pretty well. I'm happy with it. Um, the takeaway I come again to from it, and this is based, I've, I've obviously looked at film many times in the past, um, is that I wish I had my 5DS with me when I took this, when I was there. Um, 
yes, it's a great photo, it's a memory. Do I wish I went was still using film? Has this got, no, this, this doesn't convince me. It's not to say that there isn't some great things to be learnt for your photography in using film, but this is very much something that is in my past before I was a professional photographer. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting print to see, but um, there you go. Now, hopefully that walkthrough has given you an idea of some of the processes I go through rather than just the simple step-by-step, -step, do this, do that type approach for things. Um, please feel free to ask questions. Um, it's people's questions often give me ideas for extra videos and things. And I've got this here for a while, so I'm going to be having a look at a slide um, and some colour negative film and a few other bits and pieces with it as well. But if you have old negatives and you've got some great photos, well, you can print them if you want. All you need is just a few bits of kit or oh, a nice printer as well really helps. So, um, yeah, thanks for watching and um, hope you've enjoyed it. Bye.